because I might, well, I will need to go. I will need to go back there during that um, performance. Our theme this evening has, uh, is Water, Water Everywhere, uh, exploring the future of water and flooding. So I'm just going to start off a little bit by introducing you to what our main thing is going to be this summer. So um, every year we try and put on a big event called the Assembly Lab. And what it is, is a pop-up science lab in a Leeds Centre venue uh, which provides space for cross-disciplinary collaboration between artists, scientists and makers, generating new artworks and prototypes and ideas that really wouldn't have happened had people stayed in their own kind of comfort zones. Uh, so we want to bring people out of them and have people who would never get together normally um, making and doing things. And there'll also be a series of workshops, talks and exhibitions over the period. So that's what it's going to be, 26th of July to the 6th of August. We are looking for ideas, volunteers, anyone who wants to help out. Um, so Jo Leng is the main yeah. contact for those things. Um, or, yeah. <laughs> or something. Need to get away. Or do, do you want to say anything else about it? Is this your only slide? Uh, it's the only slide about it. All right, so we did have dates which haven't made it onto the slide. Yeah, oh, there they are. <laughs> we do have, these are only pencil in dates because we're negotiating with bids and the person who's doing that has been ill. So it's fair, we're fairly sure that we'll get them to agree to those dates. But I don't like to say something's going to happen because we've done this before, haven't we? And it hasn't fully happened. So. Penciling those ones in. When, when they're confirmed, which I'm hoping will be in about a week, maybe two weeks, we'll be opening up. Um, we had a web form which allowed you to um, say you're interested in joining assembly. So I can't handle lots of emails. I just can't. <laughs> so I've set up web forms so that I don't get notified every time someone does something. Apply, do as much as you want on them, do multiple ones. Feel free to not fill fields in, be creative, I'm sure you all can be, but it just stops me getting emails, which I don't like. <laughs> so we're going to have a lot of, you know, if you've got workshops, you want to exhibit something, you fill in a web form, then we know, and then we've got something that we can use with bids to get us something. So we'll be trying to encourage you to fill in the forms quickly, and so you can fill them in later if you like, but it's just useful for us to have a programme which will change that we can use to, to uh, cancel. Yeah, really. and that information will be coming out on the mailing list when it's ready. Sure, we um, do have a form for volunteers as well, but as it's not there, if you are interested in volunteering at all, please come and see me. We need people at the event <coughs> to be, so just check that the space is okay, but if you're interested in doing anything, 
um, organisational. Yeah. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. There we so, go. Have we got an idea where the space will be this time? Well, this is part of the... Oh, well, so oh, back that, that will become apparent in a bit. Well, because of the way this works, oh. it's got to be an empty space in the town centre. And if, by any chance, any empty space got a contract on it, they're not going to stop the contract to allow us to use it because we really like that space. So we're only going to go have a three to two week leading, that's what it is. But the better idea of what programme we've got, the more we'll be able to say this is a good space or this is a bad space. There's a possibility it could be quite a high profile space, and so opposite Harvey Nicks or something. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got business? No. Not for me, it doesn't work for me. Who am I to say? But, so then we could be right in the centre, we could be a little bit out of the but we want to run evening events, so we're not going to be inside when the shopping malls are closed down. That's definite. Yeah. And, and the plan is that the next one of these evenings will be taking place during the assembly lab as well. So, um, right, uh, uh, right, so, um, yeah. Thank you. 
her is to share some insights from different perspectives and approaches to the future of water and flooding, to stimulate some cross-discipline discussion, to explore how the arts, sciences and maker communities are responding to and could respond to flooding. So tonight's speakers are Steve Bottoms, Amanda Crossfield and Guy Wyler. First of all, I would like to introduce our artist Steve Bottoms, who is Professor of Contemporary Theatre and Performance at the University of Manchester. It's just over there. <laughs> um, Steve has held a number of academic posts and publishing, published widely in theatre and performance studies. He is also a theatre practitioner, variously as director, performer and writer, dramaturg. His recent research related practice has explored the use of site specific performance in context of environmental change. Steve will share his one man performance, Too Much of Water, that features some of the people who had too much water in their lives and in their homes when the River Air broke its banks on Boxing Day 2015. The show explores the devastating effect, devastating impact of the flood on Riverside residents in Shipley Building and Solitaire. But the story is told with theatrical flair and a streak of black comedy. <laughs> As Laertes says of his drama sister, Ophelia, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, why shed more tears when there's already too much water? And see, would you like to become too much of water? <laughs> Yes, uh, we're just um, going to... Okay, um, hello everybody. Uh, if I ask this, I'll ask because I haven't done it for a little while. Uh, so, because of how hard I'm trying to put that food. So, anyway, uh, we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, normally there's a Christmas tree, okay, around which the friends are gathered, but um, you'll just have to imagine that for today, okay? And then, unless anybody wants to be repeated. Okay, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Too Much of Water. My name is Steve, and I will be your narrator. Take a river. Could be any river, really, but this one is the River Air, one of the great rivers of Yorkshire, wending its eternal way from its source near Malham, en route towards Leeds, the Humber, and the North Sea. Take a town. Again, it could be any town, but this one is Shipley, north of Bradford which encompasses the model Victorian mill village of Saltaire. This is Titus Salt's new mill, which was built right next to the river in um, 1868. And directly across from the mill, also part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Saltaire, is uh, Roberts Park, featuring the popular Half Moon Cafe, and a cricket pitch with a pavilion and a score. <laughs> it's three o'clock in the afternoon on December the 26th, 2015, and the park has become a mecca for flood tourists. There's a big crowd up on the footbridge overlooking the river, taking photographs and gawking at the speed of the water. The cricket pitch and the lower lake have become, sorry, the lower park have become a lake. There's water several steps up around Half Moon Cafe and uh, even the Boathouse Inn, which some of you will be familiar with, is underwater. Onlookers though are marvelling at the resilience of a solitary blue municipal rubbish bin, <laughs> which is still standing up against the onslaught of a torrential barrage of water. That is Super Bin, yes. You should change your title from Superposition to Super Bin. Okay. There it is. In Solterre itself, nobody is too badly affected by the flooding. The residents of uh, Riverside Court, the apartment complex that now forms part of New Mill, uh, have had their access in and out of the building temporarily cut off. But nobody actually lives in the flooded ground floor, which is all lobbies, bike storage, car parking, an astute piece of planning by the architects. 
No, in uh, the big story, this district, Shipley, Bailden, Saltaire, is very far from being the place worst affected by flooding this Christmas. But this is a show about some of the little stories. Stories about some of the people living not so far from here who were not out here in the park taking photographs on Boxing Day. Shipley Ward begins over here, to the west, where the river air is just coming out of a great oxbow bend that has taken it around Bingley. Here, Braxton Drive snakes downhill from the main Bingley Road to curl up in a cul-de-sac not far from the river. From the street itself, though, you wouldn't even know there was a river there. This is Richard. He's lived on Braxton Drive for the last five and a half years. When he bought the place, he was advised that it was highly unlikely ever to flood. <laughs> and this is Philip. He lives down here, on the Bailden side of the river, in a little row of four houses known as Air Close. Close to the air. <laughs> Indeed, very close to the air. <laughs> These houses sit precariously in the middle of an otherwise green floodplain area. So, uh, and they were badly hit when it last flooded here in October 2000. Water up to the windowsills. So Philip knows full well that he's at risk. It's December 2015 and he's been keeping an uneasy eye out on the river now for weeks. As well he might. In November, flooding in the Bradford area, sorry, flooding? The rainfall in the Bradford area was three times what's normally expected. In December, again, it's running at three times the annual monthly average. The ground can't take any more water. It's completely saturated. And the beer cellar at Bailden Woodbottom Working Men's Club, where Philip is the permanent secretary, has already flooded once this, this month, ruining a whole lot of beer. The club sits right next to Bailden Bridge the one road bridge in the Shipley area. This flat 1930s concrete construction sits low across the river and Philip has been on the phone to the council trying to get them to come and remove the tree branches and other debris that keep building up against the upstream side of the river because when those three arches get blocked up, the bridge becomes a dam. That means bad news for everyone. And there won't be snow in Africa this Christmas time. The greatest gift they'll get this year is life. Oh, come on, join in. <laughs> when the rain grows, no rain or rivers flow. Do they know it's Christmas time at all? It's the evening of Christmas Day. People up and down the town have opened their presents, stuffed their bellies, and driven their relatives crazy. Philip has spent the evening at the club. It's open for members even on Christmas Day. But then at around 11 p.m., he walks, staggers the short distance home. <laughs> at around 11.30, just as he's getting ready to turn in for the night, the telephone rings. It's an automated voice message from the Environment Agency. And this is, word for word, what Philip heard. This is a flood warning from the Environment Agency. For the River Air at Shipley. Flooding is expected in the early morning. Flooding is expected to affect up to 804 properties in this area. Activate your flood response plan if you have not already done so. <laughs> what does that mean? So. Flooding is expected in the early morning. Is that, is that the small hours? Breakfast time? Philip finds a phone number for the Environment Agency and calls them back. He gets somebody here in a call centre, somewhere not very local. When do you expect the river air to peak? He asks. In the Shipley area. The operator isn't very sure, but he thinks it's peaking around about now. <laughs> Philip looks out of the window, sees that the river poses no danger to him around about now, and decides to go to bed. After all, he's had these warning calls before, and they've been false alarms. And this is important to remember, that even the people who saw the flood coming, didn't see it coming. Boxing Day. 4 a.m. At Branson Drive, 
Richard is awoken by the sound of rain hammering on his roof. Neither Richard nor anyone else on his street has received a warning message, something for which the Environment Agency will later apologise. <laughs> Looking out of his bedroom window, Richard sees that his back garden, which faces towards the river, is partly covered in water. Richard, like most on Braxton Drive, lives in a bungalow. He has no upstairs, but as a precaution, he opens the loft, pulls down the drop-down ladder, and begins transporting a few items of personal value up into the roof space. At air close, there's been no sign of alarm during the small hours. This is Anne, Philip's next door neighbour. At 7.15, she notices from her bedroom window that the decking in her garden, which is right next to the river, is completely underwater. She doesn't panic because she's seen this before. In the years that Anne's been living here, the, the river has broken its banks on several occasions, but never come as far as the house. Still, she sends her husband, Graham, out to check what's happening outside, just in case. And he returns to tell her that there is water well out across the field, immediately upstream of the house. Graham begins trying to wake the neighbours to alert them, while um, their son, John, unplugs the television and takes it upstairs. Then he unplugs the Christmas tree, takes that upstairs, baubles and all. For Anne, though, this is still precautionary. She's still assuming this will not be bad. She puts some bacon under the grill because everybody likes a bacon sandwich for breakfast on Boxing Day. Eight o'clock. Mum, says John, I wouldn't bother with bacon. There's water coming in both doors. <laughs> Anne turns off the grill, throws the bacon at the dog, and must think it's Christmas, and begins packing two large Asda bags with whatever she can salvage from the fridge. By 8.30, the water in Anne's kitchen is up to her knees, and the dog is swimming. <coughs> Nine o'clock. At Branson Drive, the river has finally made it all the way up Richard's back garden and is lapping at his sandbagged back door. 9.15. This is Val. She's still in bed watching TV when the telephone rings. It's her neighbour, Cheryl, calling to tell her that there's water in the garden. <laughs> Val and Cheryl are among the residents of Hurst Mill, a former water mill on the edge of Hurst Wood, which was turned into apartments in the 1970s. Val has lived here for 28 years, which means that her neighbours tend to turn to her in circumstances like this because she's been here long enough to know what's what. Val's home actually straddles the mill race. This bit here, once upon a time there was a water wheel in her living room. But um, the structure is effectively up on stilts, it's built a good height above the river. So in 28 years, Val has never had unwelcome water in her home. Even in 2000, came as far as the doorstep, didn't come into the house. But today, looking out of her back window, Val can scarcely believe what she's seeing. The land beneath the mill structure, the island between the mill race and the main river, has completely disappeared underwater. It's as if her house is sitting on top of a torrent, and the water is moving at a speed that she's never seen before. And it's full of debris, tree branches, garden furniture, even fridge freezers are being swept along by the current, battering off the structure. This is not good. 9.30. At air close, having packed and secured everything they can against the rising floodwaters, Anne and Graham evacuate their house, heading for higher ground. Next door, Philip too is wading out, cursing that call centre operator under his breath. The water is freezing cold and it's well in over the tops of his wellies, so he retreats to the club to try to get dry, except that 20 minutes later, it follows him in there. <laughs> 10 o'clock. At Braxton Drive, forget the sandbag back doors, there's water coming up through the floorboards. Richard and his neighbours up and down the street are frantically packing what they can into their cars, but it's about to get a whole lot worse very quickly. Directly to the west, the river has finally overtopped the banks of an adjacent farmer's field, and it now comes rushing like a wave across the field and straight down the middle of Braxton Drive, demolishing garden walls as it comes. And it's in the front door and it's through the house and those people who haven't already left are trying to get their swamped cars to drive out along the street through rushing, filthy, knee-deep water. At Hurst Mill, Val's car is parked safely at the top of a steep driveway 
she keeps coming back and forth with more bags from the house to load it until the water pressure on either side of her front door is so bad that she can't even open it. Suddenly she hears a colossal banging noise from the river and looking out she notices that a, an enormous tree trunk <laughs> has been driven into the mill's weir with the force of a battering ram. Before her very eyes, the weir begins to break up. Chunks of rubble are lifted out of the previously stable structure and are swept off downstream towards Saltaire by the sheer force of the water. Quarter to eleven. This is Linda. She's just waking up after having slept off a particularly enjoyable Christmas night with her partner Sean and their friend Jack Daniels. <laughs> Linda lives at the bottom of Lower Holm, a street of former mill cottages in Lower Belden. And uh, this is her neighbour across the way, Margaret. Linda and Margaret's houses are separated from the river by the overspill car park of the Wix DIY store. And normally they wouldn't be able to see any water at all from their homes because the river is set well down at this point in a deep stone wall channel that was built for it when this area was an industrial estate. But uh, today, looking out of her bedroom window, Linda is alarmed to see that there is water surging along right up to the brim of the channel. It looks ready to overspill into the uh, overspilled car park. <laughs> she sends Sean down to the basement, which flooded with groundwater in 2000, and sure enough, there's water down there coming up through the earth floor. They quickly secure what they can, and then head out to check on the river itself. Water is starting to leak out across the car park, and immediately upstream at B&M, they can see two large shipping containers just bobbing about, and just <laughs> dancing around in the water. Linda realises that that must mean that Belden Bridge has become a dam and that just as happened in 2000, the river has diverted itself right out across Woodbottom Cricket Pitch as far as Green Lane and is now pouring itself back in the main into the main channel by flowing straight across the retail area east of the bridge. Looking up at the footbridge that connects Low Holm to Dock Lane, Linda sees something caught in the side panel, something that's been crushed into it. It looks like a caravan or something. It's, it's Alan's caravan. He lives in it up there by the B&M Garden Centre. Later on TV, Linda will see camera phone footage of Alan's caravan being crushed against the bridge. It gets played over and over again on every news broadcast. You probably saw it. Everything Alan owned was in that caravan. But to the cold eye of the camera, it's just a flood spectacle. As the afternoon wears on and the water creeps inexorably across the car park, more and more people begin to arrive from who knows where to gawk at the water, at the spectacle of it. Linda's neighbour, Les, tries telling some of, them, some of them that this is serious, we're flooding here, why don't you just F off? But what can you do? Wix is open for business and people are coming in for the half price lighting sale. And now some clown in a 4x4 Land Rover on jacked up suspension is driving around the car park in circles for kicks. Hey! Sending up waves of water in every direction. Six o'clock. Dark and wet. Philip and his wife Debbie, Anne and Graham. Val and Cheryl, Richard and many others like them have taken refuge with family or friends or in nearby hotels. At La Holm, the water is up to Linda's doorstep and it's seven or eight feet up in the basement. Her neighbour Margaret has already left. It's not safe, she kept saying. They're saying you need to get out. But Linda's problem is that she has two cats and only one cat carrier. She keeps checking the Environment Agency website for updates, but there's been nothing new since that warning call went out last night. They must be inundated, she reasons. When she tries calling their emergency hotline, all she gets is a recorded message. Action needed. But what kind of action? 
<laughs> Linda doesn't want to be one of those people who ignores official advice, but how much higher can the water get? In the end, she and Sean opt to take the cats, retreat upstairs, and crack open the Jack Daniels. <laughs> At around 11 o'clock at night, unnoticed by them, the water begins slowly to recede. 14 hours later, for anyone still at home to hear it, the telephone rings. This statement was issued on Sunday, the 27th of December, 2015, at 12.51pm. A flood warning is in force for the River Air at Shipley. Flooding is expected for Shipley, including east of Hurst Mill, extending through Roberts Park towards Belden Bridge. Your safety, hope and possessions are at risk. Act now. Levels on the river air, air are starting to fall. Levels on the air, air are currently forecast to fall. The below the levels of the Finally, tomorrow morning, the 28th of December, 2015. This message will be updated as the situation changes. December the 27th, the morning after, dawns to glorious blue skies and bright sunshine reflecting off standing water in the park. The level is already some way down on where it was yesterday, but it'll be another couple of days before the river receives to something like normal and Belden Bridge can be reopened. In the meantime, various idiots decide to ignore the road closure and just ford across, their bridge in the, across the bridge in their cars through a foot or two of flood water. Philip sees one man deliberately abandoning his waterlogged vehicle in the middle of the bridge. Engines knackered! I'm trying to claim on the insurance! <laughs> and on the whole, Linda wakes on the 27th to discover that she is, shall we say, as safe as houses. The water stopped at a doorstep but didn't come into the house. Still, she's without power because her basement electricity meter has been completely submerged. And when she tries calling her supplier, N Power, who also provided with gas, which is also out, she discovers that they have no emergency service. Oh, we just supply power to the grid, madam. Hmm. When she calls the national grid, she establishes that their responsibility ends at the threshold to the property. Her meter is none of their concern. It takes Linda six days and 50 pounds in telephone time before Empower is oh so politely persuaded to take responsibility for reconnecting her. <coughs> Across the way, Margaret is facing problems of her own. The water under her house has partially collapsed the foundations, meaning that her living room floor has caved in. The furniture that couldn't be taken upstairs is now sitting askew, unusable as anything except rocking chairs. But when she calls her housing association, to which she's paid rent for the last 33 years, she discovers that their office is closed for Christmas. You'll have to call back on Tuesday, love. That's uh, Tuesday the 29th. Hello, that's uh, Air Close. Anne and Margaret's, Anne and Graham's house even, is underwater for about 48 hours. When they're finally able to return, they find a watermark more than five feet up the wall in the living room. And although they'd secured all the doors before they left, external and internal, there's evidence that a powerful current has swept through the house. The fridge freezer and the Welsh dresser have been dumped on their sides, things from the conservatory have wound up in the kitchen, and there is a thick layer of stinking, sewagey filth that's been deposited over everything. Outside, Graham spots a section of their garden decking hanging from a tree a hundred yards downstream. Anne stands amidst the wreckage of their home, trying to start a list of all the things that will need to be done, when she notices that the pad is getting soggy in her hand, just from the water vapour in the atmosphere. For the next several months, she will have dehumidifiers in her home, pumping up to 15 litres of water a day out of the very air. The effort to help those affected by the flooding swiftly kicks into gear. The uh, local council, Bradford Council, arranges for council taxpayers in the flood zone to have a £500 rebate placed back into their bank accounts, no questions asked. It's a, a thoughtful gesture, just 
not a very targeted one. Among those people to receive the £500 are lots of people living in upstairs flats like these at Hurst Mill who have little or no flood damage to repair. But still, never look a gift horse in the mouth, right? You tell it, anyone? The voluntary effort, too, swiftly kicks into gear. The Salvation Army in Shippe is at the centre of the relief effort, taking in donations and coordinating their distribution. Val is overwhelmed by the generosity as she is given all, everything that she asks for, from mops of buckets, down to tea, coffee, even toothpaste. Val's son Max puts out a Facebook status saying, anyone who wants to come down and help, please do. We're trying to clean my mum's house out. And before they know it, they're flooded anew with people they barely know who just want to help. People are saying, uh, what can I do? What can I do? There's so many volunteers, Val can't even manage them. They say, what can I do? And she's like, I don't know, just uh, here's a mop in a bucket, just wash something down, and they're giving her their number saying, anything you need, just give us a call. Val is just beginning to think that maybe everything is going to be all right when she discovers that her property is not insured. Hurst Mill is a collective freehold that has shared buildings insurance, and it turns out that the chap upstairs, <coughs> who sorted out the current policy, hadn't thought they needed to insure against flooding. At Hurst Mill, there is very nearly <laughs> Even those who do have insurance, though, well, the uh, policies turn out to be something of a dice throw. Anne and Graham have to wait two or three weeks before the loss adjusters can get around to them, and by that stage, the water uh, has soaked into the walls to such an extent that all of the plaster and stud walls throughout the entire downstairs of the house have got to be ripped out. The structure peeled back to its skeletal brickwork. It's going to be eight or nine months before the house can be dried out and rebuilt sufficiently for them to move back in. And yet, right next door, Phillips, oh no, that's Richard. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> right next door, Philip is back home before the end of January. His insurers, responding to a strongly worded pressure from Philip for swift action, have sent in a company called Disaster Care, who bring in 10 fans of four dehumidifiers to dry the place out quick smart. There's still a smell of damp, but the plaster doesn't need to come off. Still, the sheer speed of this operation has come at something of a cost. <laughs> Philip discovers that <coughs> disaster care have taken very little care with what they threw in the skip. Among the flood damaged items missing from his home are passports, pension details, a coin collection, his wife's prescription glasses, and even a diamond ring. Every mortal bleeding thing is gone in that skip. And now he's having to fill out a contents insurance claim, but he can't even list things properly because it's all gone in the skip. As a part-time DJ, Philip owns a collection of some 1,200 CDs, but his insurer informs him that he can't claim these as a single item, CD collection. Instead, he must list them all individually. Artist, title, value, 1,200 times. And he takes it to At the home, Margaret is finally visited by a surveyor sent by her housing association to check on her caved in living room floor. Oh, yeah, it's a bit uneven, isn't it? I can't live in my house, says Margaret. I can't sit on my furniture. Margaret is sent a copy of Accent Housing's decant policy. That's decant as in wine, only in this case it applies to people. Wherever possible, we will carry out major work to our properties whilst the resident is still where the works are so extensive that it is not possible for the resident to remain. We will offer where I live in there. <laughs> what? <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> Accent Housing are eventually persuaded to rewrite their decap policy <laughs> and to put Margaret and her dog, Millie, up in Shipley's Ibis Hotel until her floors can be properly excavated and fixed. In the end, she's there for four months without a kitchen. <coughs> she even has to petition Accent Housing for daily living costs because she's having to eat every meal out. The only thing that makes this at all bearable is the staff at the IBIS who are all fantastically helpful, from the cleaners up to the management. On uh, Mother's Day, Sunday the 6th of March, Margaret is treated to box fizz for breakfast with buns and chocolates. 
Unfortunately, though, as the months wear on, the general public sympathy for flood victims seems to seep away. <laughs> um, in January, there's tremendous pour outpouring of, of goodwill and support, but as the media cycle moves on, a general amnesia seems to sink in. Anne and Graham notice it especially because they run a small business locally, so they're dealing with relative strangers almost every day. In January, there's tremendous support from all their customers as they try to keep their minds on the business while their minds are really on the house. But by May, Anne is depressed by the loss of interest. If she makes a mistake on someone's invoice, I'm sorry, my head's not quite with me yet, nobody wants to hear about why. The flood is old news, except to those people still living with it. It's like a whole life stops, says Anne. And you've got two full-time jobs because you have to keep going back to the house every day and it's cold and miserable and you open the door and all you get is darkness. It's just a darkness and a cold chill and this smell. And my daughter, I can't get used to not seeing her every day. We were offered rooms in different people's houses, you see, and, well, I mean, if she was getting married or something, I'd have been preparing myself not to see her all the time, but to have her just torn away from me like that. It's hard. For Philip's wife, Debbie, it's all too hard. She can't face living in their house, fearing the next flood, and so they've sold up at the bottom of the market for half the price the house would have fetched a year ago. It's been the most stressful time in my life by far, says Philip. <laughs> it's like the house has just been blown up and you don't know where you're going. And I mean, this weather we're getting now, it's just totally different from the weather we used to get. You would never expect, at this time of year, you would never expect to get all these floods. When I was a kid, we used to get snow four feet deep. Now it's just rain. The times have changed. <clears throat> we don't even seem to get seasons anymore, do we? Says Val. I mean, spring we sort of see because the daffodils come up, but apart from that, I do worry what winter's going to bring, though. We've been told it's a question of when, not if. The council is making £5,000 grants available to those people wishing to flood defend their homes by treating exterior brickwork, by uh, installing waterproof doors and windows, one-way valves for drains and toilets. And those people making changes are also doing exterior refits, like a uh, washable render instead of plaster, rewiring closer to the ceiling, washable flagstones or floorboards rather than carpeting, with rugs you can quickly take up. For now though, Val for one is living with bare floors and flood-damaged Artex walls. It's all gonna come off. She says, but I just need to get through this first winter. That's how I feel. Get through this next one, and then I'll start to settle back in. It's September the 11th, 2016, and this performance premieres in Roberts Park, not far from that blue bin, as part of Saltair Festival. Several of my interviewees come to see the show, but uh, not Richie. He's only just moved back into his house a week ago. Today he's enjoying a much needed holiday in Barcelona. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Too Much of Water. Our title comes from a line in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Too much of water hast thou, poor Ophelia, and therefore I forbid my tears. This is Barbie. <laughs> but for now, let's pretend she's Ophelia, she's Hamlet's girlfriend, Ophelia. She's been cut up because Hamlet, having unkindly rejected her, has now gone and accidentally murdered her dad. She decides to um, <coughs> gather a wreath of wild flowers, but to do so, she climbs out along the riverbank. Now, if you've seen debris still hanging from the trees over the river, still there since Christmas, well, <laughs> part of the reason is safety. Climbing or reaching out over water is just not a very clever thing to do, as Ophelia discovers when she falls in. Her clothes spread wide, we are told, and mermaid-like a wild, they bore her up. But Ophelia does nothing to try to help herself. She just lies there, singing, as one incapable of her own distress. 
Finally, her garments, heavy with their drink, pulled the poor wretch down to muddy death. Ladies and gentlemen, in these days of changing weather, let's not just lie there in the water, incapable of our own distress. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them.